So I, I'm going to tell you a, a bit about uh, cancer and uh, a little more about actually my own experience and my own sort of journey uh, in terms of cancer. I have a vitriolic relationship with cancer. I, I want to do everything I possibly can and have dedicated my career to seeing if we can't do more about this disease. And as you've just heard, uh, every patient faces this disease with the same attitude, it's war. And so the war metaphor has stuck. I think it's actually a pretty good metaphor. Could I have the first slide, please? The war on cancer actually started uh, in this room two days before Christmas. This is Richard Nixon, likely one of his better days. He'll look back on, I'm sure. But this day, two days before Christmas, started the official war on cancer, 1971. Now, this was all extraordinarily well-meaning. This, this was actually uh, precipitated by some extraordinary advocates, including Teddy Kennedy at the time, and Paul Rogers, and Mary Lasker. And the signing of this was all with the best intentions. But I have to say, it was done at a time when we had just put a man on the moon, and the expectation was that day that we would be done with cancer in 10 years. 10 years. And Senator Yarbrough, as you said, wanted it done actually by the time that we uh, reached uh, bir the, the country's birthday. So this was the attitude at that time. If you had enough resources and you had the will, you could do anything. Um, this set us on a path that I think has been not a healthy path because expectations were too high. We expected one institute, the National Cancer Institute, to do everything, to take care of patients, to do the fundamental research, et cetera, et cetera. There was no plan here, and there was no accountability. So we started a war, and I would, I would actually say to you today, we have never actually engaged in a war on cancer. And um, Cliff showed you a lot of statistics. I'm just going to ha have you pay attention to one, and he brought it to your attention is that since the 1950s, the mortality rate of cancer has changed very, very little. We're doing better with five years survival, but as you see in these statistics, one and a half million new diagnoses this year, and I wish it was gonna be confined to that, and 560,000 people every single day, 1,500 people dying from this disease. And I would, I would argue that we are beginning to take these statistics for granted, and it makes me mad. Um, so if you worry about numbers and you worry about money, this disease is costing us roughly $264 billion a year. Now, is this our problem? You bet your life it's not our problem. It's a global problem. And increasingly, this is a tsunami. We see it out there. We're doing nothing about it, in my opinion, to really take care of this problem. If you look at the number of cases globally today, 7.6 million. With the aging of these populations, including our own, you're going to see an increase to about 10.3 million deaths worldwide. It's going to overtake anything we've ever seen in the history of man. And if you look at the cost, the Lance Armstrong Foundation and the ACS did a little study this year to see if they could estimate the global cost of this disease. This does not include the cost of taking care of people. This is just the cost of lo lost productivity. $895 billion, 1.5% of the world GDP. Now, it, that should get our attention. That should really get our attention. So, those folks who signed that act back in 1971, I think, were very prophetic. This was a tsunami that was coming, and it's arriving in our generation and the next generation, and we're not doing nearly enough. So I want to turn to what we've gotten for our money. Because we hear, when I was by eight years at the NCI, we heard a lot of complaining and bellyaching about how we're not winning the war on cancer. Um, what do we get for $109 billion, which is what we've invested since we started the war on cancer? A lot. We have a cancer enterprise that actually uh, has never been created in the history of the world. We've got over 5,000 people working on this disease on any given day. We give that many awards every year. It's probably more like 10,000 if you actually add in the other scientists from the other sectors. Uh, we've got um, 
66 cancer centers. These are big cancer centers, well beyond MD Anderson and Sloan Kettering. Uh, we've got all kinds of specialized programs. The private sector is investing probably equally to what we're investing every year. We invest about $4.96 billion at the NCI this year. So this is a huge enterprise. The question is, is it being deployed appropriately? I mean, are we asking the right questions? Are we actually are we actually moving in the directions that we should be moving? And you heard it from Danny Hillis a little while ago. Uh, we aren't asking questions any differently. I would argue that in many ways we have become, uh, we've gotten into a, a few ruts, and I'm going to tell you how I think we might be able to get out of those. So you want to know what cancer is. All right, I'm going to tell you, this is, uh, this is 39 years of progress on this slide. 39 years, and I don't want to trivialize what we know about cancer. We know a hell of a lot more than we knew, certainly in 1971. It's phenomenal what we actually do know. This has become a disease that has actually given us the biotechnology industry, it's given us cell biology, it's given us a lot of the things that we've talked about here in the last two days. But basically, cancer starts with a change in a gene, as you've heard, a few changes. And you may inherit a few of these, 23andMe can tell you, and Navigenics can tell you. Uh, sometimes you, those, those uh, genes will cause you cancers. Mostly they don't. Inherited, inherited cancers are very few indeed. It's mostly after you're born, and it's mostly after you start to live that you get cancer. And you get exposed. Any of that list can actually contribute to damaging DNA, and that's what causes cancer. Now, I'd like to tell you that we knew an awful lot about that left-hand column. For example, viruses cause cancer. Yes, they do. You hear a lot about HPV. We don't spend hardly any money in this area, and we need to spend a lot more. We know that stomach cancer is caused by H. pylori, et cetera. This is an extraordinarily complex process beyond what I've actually shown up here. As you can see, the mutations are moving along and they're accumulating. It's not that simple. It's not that simple at all. This is occurring in three-dimensional space. There's a lot of crosstalk going on, and it's sitting in a microenvironment. There's lots of things going on. And I'll be honest with you, we don't know yet where the cancer sits versus where it came from are extraordinarily important. The information is actually not known all that well yet. So if I had to tell you what I think cancer is, think of it as a computer program gone wrong. That's exactly what it is. It's information. And not only that, it's digital information. So we have digitized cancers, you've heard in the last few days. And if you think about it very simplistically, it's actually taking advantage of you. Because as a normal human being, you've built a bunch of cells, you've laid the railroad track on which your trains are going to run, and cancer uses your tracks and runs its own trains. And not only does it run its own trains, it actually does it in a way that is just absolutely amazing, and we don't know how to control it very well. Um, here's the bad news. We made a lot of progress. But once you get over to the right-hand corner that I showed you before, you get metastatic disease. We don't do very well with helping you at all. And we don't know much about who's going to have metastatic disease and who isn't. It's a huge problem. Um, I came to the Cancer Institute because there's a convergence in medicine with advanced technologies, um, what we know in genomics, what we know in science. But this is kind of the way science looked in 2002 when I went to the NCI. And I went there, actually, because I love to bring disruptive innovation to things. I love to build teams. I like to do things differently. So I went there for two years to see if I could do any of that. I stayed for eight. It was a negative cash flow job, so you might want to have somebody look at my head when this talk is over. But um, I have to say, you can do things. But this is the way we were looking at cancer. And as you heard from Danny earlier, some people think it's all about protein. Some things it's chromosomes. Some people, et cetera. So the answer is it's all of those things. And so the integration here is incredibly important in terms of understanding this disease. So I did what Richard does. I brought a whole bunch of smart people together over many, many months, uh, including people like Steve and Jean Case who are sitting out here who taught me a lot about GBM. And we actually 
prioritized a list of things that we thought if we could change these things, this could change cancer, this could accelerate progress. I don't have the time to tell you about every one of them, but what I am gonna do is to tell you about a couple of them. This enterprise is not connected. We are all doing our own thing with bioinformatics, but we are not connected. You hear a lot about electronic medical records, et cetera. The scientific enterprise is equally disconnected. So we brought something to the table called a cancer bioinformatics grid to connect our communities, and that's, that's working, and we got lots of work to do there. I'm gonna spend a minute on, on biospecimens, just I'll come back to that in a second. You heard, about pro, you heard about proteomics from Danny, very big issue in terms of biomarkers, and we tried to standardize this field, and I, I'm not gonna spend any time on that today, but cancer genomics, you've heard enormous amounts of, at this meeting. This is the era of genomics, and I have to say, up until probably a couple of years ago, we have thousands and thousands of investigators all chasing one gene, possibly two genes. So Francis Collins and I decided in 2006, can we apply what we knew or what we learned from the Human Genome Project to a cancer genome project? In other words, can we find all of the cancer genes? As you heard this morning about Alzheimer's, it's possible now with the cost, that, with the cost of actually sequencing genes. So I'm gonna come back to that. Nanotechnology is the way to, to measure lots of information. It's going to take thousands of biomarkers to measure a cancer, I'm guessing, and nanotechnology can do that. So I started something called the Nanotechnology Alliance for Can Cancer, being enormously successful. And last but not least, the program that Danny mentioned, I, I wanted to bring a lot of uh, physicists and engineers and mathematicians to this field, and I did that. Um, biospecimens. I'm gonna spend one second on this. Most important thing for personalized medicine, very badly handled at the national level. Uh, when I came to NCI, we actually uh, didn't have a plan for this. We do now, but when anyone you know goes to a hospital and you make sure their biospecimen is collected, that is the basis for personalized medicine. Make sure it has good stewardship and make sure that actually it can be accessed. Uh, the Cancer Genome Atlas, where we were trying to measure all of these genes, is big science. As you can see, it involves well over a couple, almost 300 people. And it's, it's a, a real project that actually should be done and should be done again. Because you can do this for other diseases. Basically, it's standardizing everything, it's getting enough people measuring the changes in the gene and putting everything in the public domain. And I wanna come back to that again in a minute. Everything that's digital about cancer has to go into the public domain. So a couple things we saw, this is glioblastoma, which actually is the first tumor that we ran through this process, took a long time, big learning curve. But we were able to do is show that there are different subtypes of this disease. We were able to map the genes to pathways, voila. You've got a way to now start thinking about building drugs for this disease. Um, you don't have to be a scientist to figure out this graph, actually. Uh, this is two different diseases, ovarian cancer on top. This is GBM on the bottom. Uh, this is just large changes in the chromosome. These are two entirely different diseases. So you can see on the bottom, this is brain tumors, few mutations. Up there, lots of big changes in the chromosome. So those are very different diseases. They have to be handled in very different ways. But look at the pictures you can get now in terms of what these diseases look like. You believe in team science, this is team science. This is the team that's analyzing the work that we're doing for ovarian cancer. 200 people meeting every day or every week, and depending on what's required. If the, if the idea is big enough, people will come to it. If it's disruptive enough, they don't care about their individual careers, they'll participate. Um, the program that Danny talked about, actually, all we're doing is asking the question, what occurs with cancer over time and in space? And we brought physicists, mathematicians, et cetera, to look at this, and I'm gonna show you one example. By the way, this is the group. You'll notice we have both Dr. Agus and Dr. Hillis. How privileged are we? Uh, and look at the rest of this group. It's amazing. They're amazing. Um, this is complexity. Cancer is pure complexity. And physicists are going to, I think physicists are going to answer this question for us. I think this is the, I think if I have to ask myself, what is the biggest advance that's going to be made in medicine? It's going to be this convergence of physics and biology in this century. Um, this is an example of what Danny talked about. If you could stabilize patients who are cancering, you would be looked at as a system. 
and you would be treated as a system, and we'd stabilize your disease. That's a different way of looking at cancer completely, and uh, I, he's captured it here, and I think it really says a lot. What would I do differently? I would actually, in my eight seconds, tell you that what I would do is I would not have started the way we started. I would actually, we aren't doing very much fundamental research in cancer. I think we need an institute that actually does fundamental cancer research. Maybe the government can do that, and maybe NCI should think about how we could restructure to do that. We don't translate our science, and we need to do that. Translational and clinical cancer research collaborative. I thought the Alzheimer's idea this morning is a much better way to start. Bring the private sector to the table from the beginning. And if this consortium could be created, I think you get lots of commercialization. I think you get lots of things moving quickly. Um, last thing, advocacy for cancer has changed everything. This is 1998. We had, a Washington, we had a march on Washington, 500,000 people showed up. The next year, we started to double the budget for the NIH. Advocacy works. Cancer is too important to leave to the government. You have to take it on because absolutely every patient, as you heard from Bruce and you heard from everybody, it's like a lightning bolt. They're fighting a war. We have to fight it with them. Thank you very much.